All right, well, let me get into my message here. I don't know if you saw it this week, but this week I made a post on Facebook where I, I shared this incredible, awesome testimony. And the testimony was this. The leader of the Church of Satan in South Africa got radically, radically saved. Come on, church. So I want to tell you right now, I don't care what things look like and what's going on in the world, okay? Nobody is beyond the grace of God, the goodness of God, and the love of God. If that end, come on now. If that guy can get saved who was a worshiper of Satan and all into that satanic stuff and, and being a leader, if he can get saved, anybody can get saved. All right? Anybody can get saved. And this is the key. Now, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit more of a focus on evangelism, doing uh, outreach, being witnesses for Christ. It's really a part of the Great Commission, something that we should never lose focus of, okay? You know, uh, and I'm going to say this. I know that there's a lot of frustration in the body of Christ on the way things are right now, especially here in America and how things look and this and that. And church, I'm just going to tell you right now, typically the way that we look at the answer to that is not the answer. You know, we'll, we'll quote like Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek. But check this out. I agree with humbling ourselves. I agree that prayer is powerful. I agree that seeking the face of God is an awesome thing. But if you read the chapter, if you read the context of what's being said there, guess who it is that brings the destruction? Guess who it is that brings the famine, the persecution, the marauding armies and this? It's God. And the reason being because it's tied to the law. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen is under the old covenant dispensation of the law it's not applicable today that's not the answer to a world being changed the answer to the world being changed is what jesus said right before the ascension before his ascension the last operation order he gave the church was to go into the world and preach the good news to preach the gospel not to go out and condemn people not to go out there and tell people that God's pouring out wrath and judgment on the world. That's not the good news. How in the world can that be good news? You know, the word gospel comes from the Greek word, a Greek word that actually uh, carries the connotation of the too good to be true news. So if what you're hearing, if someone is saying that this is the gospel or someone is preaching that this is the gospel and it doesn't come across as being the too good to be true news, you might want to question whether that's the gospel or not. Yeah. Even Paul said that in Galatians, that's another gospel. And so if we want to see the world change, if we want to see America turning back to God, the key is, is that we as Christians, you know... And, Come back to the place and, and embrace what Jesus was teaching, what he was preaching right before the ascension, and that was the Great Commission. Each and every one of us are going to actively, have to be actively involved in sharing the gospel. That's the key. That's the key. And when we look at this example of this leader of the church of Satan, you know, I'm reading this testimony. It's powerful. It's powerful. It's powerful. So I'm reading this testimony, and I'm just moved big time. And as I'm reading it, there's three things that I noted that stand out to me big time. The gospel, unconditional love, and the power of encounter. And that's what I'm titling my message here this morning. The gospel, unconditional love, and the power of encounter. So I'm reading this testimony. And these are the things that he actually talks about. He talks about the gospel. He talks about experiencing unconditional love. And he talks about the power of encounter, of, ha of having a powerful, powerful visitation from Jesus. And so I just want to take a little time this morning to kind of, you know, elaborate on these three things. I mean, I don't have time to get into the nitty uh, gritty of, uh, of any one of these this morning. But I just want to just kind of go through these real quick. One, as a reminder to us. You know, I'm reading this and I'm like, wow. You know what? This sounds so similar to my salvation experience. 
And I'm hoping that what I share today kind of lights a fire in some of you, a, a reminder of what your salvation experience is like and how you relate to God because it's so easy to kind of get distracted. And then secondly, hopefully that this will be an encouragement to, to get you motivated, to get us all motivated so that when we're going about our daily lives, we're going to school, we're going to work, we're going, to, we're going on vacation. I can tell you when Julie and I go on vacation, we don't leave God in Athens, Tennessee, and we don't leave church now that we got live streaming. <laughs> all right? Now, let me qualify that statement. Live streaming will never supplant coming to church personally. There's too many distractions, okay? And, and there is something powerful. I, I'd love to just talk about that this morning, but we'll save that for another message. There's nothing like coming together as a corporate body to celebrate Jesus, okay? It's vital. It's important. But anyway, so in looking at this guy's testimony, the first thing that stood out was the gospel. Everybody say the gospel. And again, let me just say, the gospel is, it really is, the too good to be true news. Okay? And let me tell you, and, and what it's not, it's not the bad news. And the thing that kind of rubs me today is it's like, the, the church, it's like, our message to the, the world is the bad news. No, it's not bad news. What we have to share with the world, what we have to tell the world is the good news of Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do real quick is I'm just going to go through 10 quick bullet points here of what the gospel is, okay? I'm going to keep it real simple. I'm going to go through this real quick. You're going to love this. Number one, God is not counting people's sins against them. Second Corinthians, come on, 519. Number two, we're not under law. We're under grace. Romans 6, 14. Number three, where sin abounds, so much more does grace abound. Come on now. Where sin abounds, so much more does grace abound. Pastor, but what about, you know, what about those who are committing abortion? What, are those, what about those who are practicing homosexuality? What about those who are rejecting the God? Hey, where sin abounds, so much more does God's grace abound. That's the answer. Not God's judgment and wrath. Number four, God is not fighting against us. He's fighting for us. Come on now. If God be for us, who can be against us? Number five, <laughs> our sin debt has been paid past, present, and come on, future, and he's paid it in full. Number six, Jesus is the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not just for ours, but for the whole world. See, I'll hear this all the time. That I'll, people will say, but pastor, but pastor, I get it. You know, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, there's therefore no more condemnation. There's no condemnation. But the world, they're under judgment, aren't they, pastor? They're, what did I just read? Jesus is the propitiation and the atoning sacrifice for our sins, which means that Jesus has paid the price for our sins and that he has satisfied God's anger and wrath against sin. And guess what? But it doesn't stop there. It's not just for those of us who are believers. It says, and for the whole world. For the whole world. This is our message to the world. This is, you get into, you don't have to be this, this, well, scholar, theologian, etc., etc., etc. You just got to be able to talk to people and share these kinds of things with people because if this is what you're living in this, and this is what you believe, this is what you understand, man, it should be, I mean, you should be fired up about telling someone about the fact that God is good. That's what this is about. Number seven, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son in church. He is still enforcing this amazing, awesome love today. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. Number eight, He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Come on now. Number nine, He's a friend that sticks, that sticks closer than a brother. Come on. Number ten, check it out. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And under the new covenant of grace, our message is a message of love, mercy, and reconciliation, not judgment, wrath, and condemnation or punishment. I know this is a shocker to many of you. See, I used to preach the opposite of this years ago. Till God opened my eyes 
to the new covenant of grace, to his goodness and to his mercy. And I'm not the only one preaching this stuff. If you think that I'm kind of some lone ranger out here, I can give you many names. Hey, Andrew Womack, come on. Joseph Prince, Kenneth Copeland, come on now. Bill Johnson. Ten really good bullet points on what the gospel is all about. But hey, I'm not going to stop there. How about some more? Do you want some more of how we define that? Let's go. Number 11, for while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Number 12, come on. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Come on. 13, the promises of God are yes and amen. Not no, 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 no. Number 14, Jesus said, if you speak to the mountain, command it to move, it will move. We're in a begging mode when we should be in a declaring mode. God, please. Jesus said, if you speak to the mountain, command it to move, it'll move. We've got to start using our authority. We're not beggars anymore. On this side of the cross and being children of God, we're not beggars. We're not paupers. We're children of the Most High God. We're royalty. Do you believe that this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number 15, Jesus said, The works I do, greater works you will do. Hey, that's good news. What works did he do? He healed the sick, raised the dead, and he cast out demons. Come on. Hey, and he says, The works I do, greater works you'll do. You want me to keep going? <laughs> I'll just give you one more. Here's the bonus. And Jesus said, Behold, I give you power and authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means will be able to hurt you. That's good news, church. You want me to keep going? No, we'll stop right there. I got some other things I got to cover. But hey, this is the good news of the gospel. These are the things, the kinds of things that we need to be focusing on. And not just focusing on, we need to be teaching, we need to be preaching, and we need to be sharing to the world outside of this church. Which takes me to the second thing, and that is unconditional love. The one thing that this leader of the church of Satan said that really grabbed him, that really hit him hard, was that he experienced unconditional love from a couple of believers. He said from a couple. Not a bunch. He didn't get that from a lot of believers. You know what he got from a lot of believers? <laughs> he was ostracized. He was, he was made fun of. People pointed the finger and said, you're going to hell. You're going, God doesn't like you. He doesn't like what. <laughs> but he had a couple of individuals, a couple of people that had the, I mean, literally had the tenacity and had the, the, the understanding that, listen, that he's just as loved as they are. See, church, this has got to change. Somehow, this has got to, somehow we as the, as the church, we as Christians, we've gotten to this place that we think that we're better than those out there. We think, we think that those who are practicing homosexuals, Satan worshipers, drug dealers, drug addicts, drunkards, fornicators, adulterers, that they're so bad and that we're so good And we get into this game. It's us versus them. Or, hey, let me get a little closer to home. Republicans pointing the finger at Democrats. <laughs> Pentecostals pointing the finger at non-Pentecostals. This stuff's got to stop. Our mission is the mission of spreading the good news of the gospel of advancing the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, you know, so I look at this, I'm reading this, and it really broke my heart that he only experienced this unconditional love from just a, a, a couple of people. The rest that, you know, as far as everybody else, I mean, it was always somebody judging, always somebody being mean and ugly. So, church, we got to break that. It's called unconditional love. Everybody say unconditional love. Unconditional love. And, he, and I know it's not easy. It's not easy. You get on 
you get on social media and you see things happening in the world and you, you hear something about somebody that said this or did that or voted for this and voted for... And then all of a sudden, man, anger rises up within us. And we like to use the excuse of, well, oh, man, I'm just, it's, it's righteous indignation. But let's, but let's get real. Let's ask the question, do you love that person? Can you love, you know, what, you know what real Christian maturity is? It's not that you're able to lay hands on the sick and they be healed. That you're able to give a powerful prophetic word. True Christian maturity is that we're able to love like Jesus loved. Believe me, it's easy to lay hands on somebody and they be healed. But it's not easy to try to love the unlovable. And what God is saying today, we've got to get the conditions out of the way. Because it's called unconditional love. Just because they maybe practice this or they practice that or they're a part of this organization or that organization. This guy was a part of the church of Satan. A leader in the church of Satan. You know, and I'm going to be honest. If I'd have seen this guy's mug on social media and the message he was preaching and the things he was saying probably even, I mean just recently, I probably, my first reaction, I would have been upset and angry. And, but God is saying you've got to get beyond that. Because if you want to be like Jesus, you've got to love the unlovable. You've got to look beyond the sin. You've got to look beyond the practice. But you see, the church, we haven't been teaching this. You see, and if we don't teach it, we're not going to walk in it. We have to be reminded of this and, and of these, th these kinds of things. But somebody might say, but pastor, isn't Jesus the rock of offense? Can I shock you? The rock of offense in context there was he was upset with, he offended the religious people, the better than thou people, the other people. It's not about us versus them. It's not that we are holy and they're not. That we are good and they're not. Paul's, Paul made it very... We, we, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, none of us could measure up. We don't measure up based on our goodness and our works and because we're this and because we're that. We measure up because, simply because of the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What makes me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So what God is saying today, today's the day. You want to see things change. Quit judging everybody. Quit condemning everybody. Use your energy instead of judging and condemning. And hey, and that includes social media. Because it's real easy to make a post on social media when the other person's not right there in your face. But well, we get real bold on social media. I dare you to go up to that person and do it face to face. Jesus did. But what God is saying today, we got to get the condition out of the way. What's the condition? You see, I almost, last week, because of that whole Roe versus Wade thing, I... I had a person that I'm a friend with on Facebook. In fact, this person's real close in, in ways, and we go back about 10 years ago when my son was in the hospital. But this person is extreme, you know, as far as where I stand and in my uh, political views and, uh, you know, and ideology and theology and all that stuff, this person's the opposite extreme. But for the last 10 years, we've been good friends on Facebook. But last week, this person made some very radical, offensive posts because this person was offended. And I, I went, I actually pulled this person's profile up and I went to the unfriend and I was going to unfriend it because, I mean, this person said some very mean and ugly and nasty things, literally coming and, and blaming the church for what had happened. I was actually appalled and I, I was shocked. And I started to hit the unfriend button. And that was, that was my thing back in the day. I ain't got time for people like this. And then God quickly convicted me and said right there, well, if you unfriend this person, how are they going to, how are they going to hear the message? And if you get on there and you attack them and you, come, you, know, you retaliate, you're just going to push them further and further away. What's more important for you right now, to win an argument or win someone to me? That's what God told me. Let me put that in better terms. What's more important, to win a political argument or win someone to Jesus? Come on, church. Let's answer that question this morning. Which is more important? Jesus. 
We act like it doesn't matter. We're going to heaven anyway, Pastor. But what about that person out there that, that is carrying that sign that says, kill the babies? That's an exaggeration, but can you look beyond that? Jesus did. When he was hanging on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They knew what they were doing. But this is how Jesus looked at it. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Again, where are we at today, church? It's like we've got to be the... I, see, you got to... Man, I've made 180 in, in 15 years. And I think it's pretty sad that we have a church today. I'm not talking about Ascension Life specifically. But the church today is we're all, we're, we're good. We're comfy. We're going to heaven. But we don't have any heart. We don't care about the people outside. And God is saying, get the condition out of the way. Pick the condition. Pick the condition. Adulterous, liar, thief, homosexual, Democrat, Republican. Get the condition out of the way and embrace the Great Commission. Embrace the Great Condition and love these people unconditionally. Do you have that within you, church? You know, I remember going back when we first started this church, well, 20 years ago, in the first year of our meeting when Jim Bob's dad was still alive, Jim, one of our elders, and his dad, we were having a discussion one day. And mighty, mighty man of God. This guy, man, we just, we'd, we'd start the service. First word out of the speaker, worship leader, whatever, he just raised those hands. He was in a wheelchair, and he'd just start speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. He'd start worshiping Jesus. It was awesome. And he told me one day, he said, he said, Pastor, and I had so much respect for this guy. He said, you know what happens when you point the finger and the context was at sin? You got three more pointing back at you. You got three more pointing back at you. Because you can call, we can, we, can, we can call anybody out, but guess what? We can be called out too. I am not perfect. He said, the biggest hypocrisy in the church is we think that we, we're okay, we're good. We, we're not sinners like that person. N notice, like that person. Like that person. <laughs> the number two element of this is unconditional love. My prayer right now is God, help me to love the unlovable. Help me to love those that really rub me wrong. That really, you know. And I'm telling you, it's, it, it's happening right now. And I get it. I get it. So when you're pushed to be, you know, to retaliate in anger, God, help me, to, help me to love that person. Help me to love that person. That's number two, amen? And then number three, the third part of this, of our, the gospel, unconditional love, and the power of encounter is the power of encounter. His testimony was that he had a powerful visitation from Jesus. He had a powerful, powerful visitation from Jesus. Church, I'm going to quote Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson, which I have a lot of respect. He's one of my favorite speakers, teachers. He said, the church, we owe the world an encounter. See, part of the problem with the church is for the last 2,000 years is we just basically... We just we, we, we came in to go through the motions mode instead of believing in a supernatural God and that God loves to manifest himself and loves to show up in a big way and love on his people. See, I, I've told you this before. I don't come to church just to sing a couple of good songs and hear a good teaching. I'm all about that. But my number one reason for coming to church is to experience the manifest power and presence of God. And that's how I got radically saved. I didn't hear an evangelistic message that 
you know, drew me to the altar. Man, I, I was just surrounded by a bunch of worshiping Jesus lovers and the power. You know, you know what our philosophy, or at least my philosophy is, <laughs> when the praise goes up, the power comes down. And it's so true. It's so true. I got a taste of it this morning, big time. My, when they started, you know, when, when Sierra beautifully started singing King of My Heart, I got chill bumps. I started feeling it. And people said, oh, it's just that emotional stuff. No, 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 no. That's, that's, that's the love of God. That's God's love. Just, sur- I mean, that's just experiencing that uh, sloppy, wet kiss from heaven. It's too bad that, that, that you know, that some, of, some of the singers of that song changed that verse because they couldn't handle the sloppy. Well, they've never experienced a sloppy, wet kiss from heaven. <laughs> Anybody here ex- experienced a sloppy, wet kiss from heaven? You know what I'm talking about? That's when you get all... <laughs> snot, tears... And guess what? That started to happen to me this past Sunday on that lodge balcony listening to Jaira. And it, and it happened this morning. Siri did a great job on that song. Beautiful job. When you hit that, I, I said, okay, here comes that high note. And I got it and I did it with you. Okay? I was like, nah. And I was like, yes, give me that microphone. But what was the main thing? Think about what we were singing. He is good. Good. Oh, come on now. Either you believe it or you don't. If you don't believe it, don't sing it. Either you believe it or don't preach it. This, the world is waiting on an encounter. But not just a power encounter, even though that's Definitely big time. But you know what? Part of what, what fuses that power encounter, what makes that power encounter so powerful is that they're able to experience the unconditional love at the same time. It's not just about us loving God. It's about us loving them. They will know we are Christians by our love, not just our love for God and not just our love for our little flock, but our love for them out there too. This is our challenge today, church, is that we are able to to walk in this unconditional love. And you're going to be tested today. Some of you, you're probably going to go out to a restaurant and you're probably not going to get the best service because I tell you right now, it's hard to find good customer service nowadays. It really, really is. And you know what? And we're quick to retaliate. And I'm not going to tip them a good tip. I'm not going to do this. And I'm not going to do that. And they're going to get, because they didn't give me... He is good, good. God, help me to love like you love. The power encounter is, you know what? And this is where we get the opportunity because once we can connect with them, and remember this, they're not going to care till they know we care. They're not going to care until they, they know that we actually care. And, and, and let me just squeeze this in. <laughs> they can see a facade a mile away. We like to put on our happy face and our love face, but it's not our heart. Because still inside for many of us, you're a sinner. <laughs> you're a Democrat. You're a Republican. You're a adulterer, a liar, a thief. They can see that. They can see that. They can see that. My prayer is that God will literally just, I mean, we can, hey, thank God we've been born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus, but we need to fully mature in that being born again into someone who can love unconditionally and not put on that happy face and that facade trying to make someone think we really do love them when really all we want to do is kind of get another notch on our belt. Oh, we want to win an argument. It's not about winning an argument today, church. It's, we're, we're, back, we're past that. 
We're at the place now. It's the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. You know, my Bible says that as pertaining to what's going on, I'm not shocked. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. And the only thing left that won't be shaken is the Republican Party. <laughs> the only thing that won't be shaken is the great United States of America. I am proud to be an American. I am absolutely proud to be an American. I will defend this country to the last straw. Amen. I've already done it. And I have no problem saying I vote conservative. And that's because of the things that the conservative platform stands for, at least at this point in time. But, but it's very clear what the Bible says. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. And at, at, the word everything means everything. The only thing left that's not going to be shaken is the kingdom of God. And in the meantime, our job is to connect with those outside of the church that aren't a part of the kingdom and get them in the kingdom. That's why it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. What are, you, what are we serving, church, outside the church? What are we serving? What food? What is on the plate? Are we serving them a ribeye steak and mashed potatoes or baked potato, you know? Uh, filet mignon, come on now, medium rare, yeah. Somebody say, no, 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 give me the rare. <laughs> oh, taste, and, is what we are sharing, oh, taste and see that God is good. Amen? Let me get you to stand.